So let me very slowly start uh, with saying a warm welcome to you from, from uh, Brussels. Um, we're very pleased that you have uh, dialed in and are joining us for this webinar. Uh, as you are aware, of course, it will be a webinar um, with a presentation of Dr. Margaret Karen of an upcoming study that should be ready in November, be published in November. Um, Ms. Margaret Karen is from the City University of London uh, and it's about consumer protection regulation in EU countries. It's a follow-up to study uh, Margaret already did in 2018. Uh, and she will look at the, uh, the differences, uh, improvements uh, of the last three years. We are organizing this webinar in the, as a part of the first European Safer Gambling Week um, that we are very happy to organize with our partner associations across Europe to promote um, safer gambling and to um, uh, create a stronger culture as well of safer gambling across Europe. As I said, this is the first time that we organize this week uh, and we aim to organize it every year and build upon this first initiative. If you're interested, this Friday we organize a second webinar that will be on AI and gambling, uh, an interesting topic hosted by an MEP, so a member of the European Parliament. And you can find more info about that webinar and about the events that are organized by our partner associations uh, on our website. So these are the partner associations that we work with on this particular European Safer Gambling Week. Um, Barry, if you can move the, to the next slide. Uh, including ourselves, of course. Um, now, before I hand over to Margaret, maybe just a little bit about us, about EGBA. Uh, we're a Brussels-based trade association. We have six members, um, Bet365, Betson, Tain, Kindred, and William Hill. And we're very happy to say that uh, in September of this year, Flutter also joined EGBA. And uh, we focus our work uh, on both EU work, so EU regulation, but also on national regulation and representing the industry across Europe uh, in, in member states, but also to make sure that we have a more united voice and organize events like this. Um, our members together have 16 and a half million customers, uh, and that's about 25% of the total online revenue. Uh, that's the way that we measure that, but that's without flutter. These are the figures of last year. Next year, we'll present new figures and then Flutter will be included. Um, we do value uh, safer gambling uh, increasingly importantly. Uh, it's the need to be accountable and sustainable by what we do as an industry. Uh, and that's, of course, in addition to the legal requirements that our members need to fulfill, uh, which Margaret is going to do her presentation about. Um, I mean, corporate and social responsibility is uh, really high on the agenda, not just for our sector, but for other sectors as well. And we need to be accountable for what we do, uh, both the things that go well, but also the things that are less well. Obviously, problem gambling is one of them and what our members do to address those issues. Um, before the summer, we published our first sustainability report uh, about what our members do. And the idea is there that we are transparent uh, about what the members are doing, but also to promote safer gambling, not just with our members, uh, but also across the sector as well. Um, before I hand over to uh, Margaret, I just show you one or two slides with uh, some data from that sustainability report. For instance, the use of safer gambling tools, which has significantly increased over the last two years. Um, here you can see 2020. Again, these are the figures uh, without Flutter. So next year they will be even higher. But these are the figures for the use of safer gambling tools. In yellow, so 33% of total customers use a safer gambling tool voluntarily, uh, which is, I think, quite interesting. And, and even more interesting is just a huge increase in the percentages. Um, Another thing that is being done much more recently is communications directly with customers, individualized communications, where I think one of the tools that is increasingly being used actually is AI to, to identify customers. But there you can see that there was a huge increase between 2019 and 2020 in the number of personalized communications to customers about their behavior. So these are uh, specific uh, messages that are addressed 
to specific customers. Again, next year, uh, if you're interested to follow up to see what uh, the developments are, in May of next year, we uh, intend to publish the follow-up study uh, and um, see and report on progress uh, and hopefully some additional information as well. Anyway, now let me turn to the presentation of today. As I said, it's an update of a study that uh, um, Margaret did in 2018, where she looked at the implementation of the member states of the EU of the Commission recommendation about safer gambling, what national regulation should as a minimum um, entail or have in there uh, in terms of remote gambling measures. Uh, 2018, the first study was done, and now the update is done. Margaret will give now a first presentation of the results. And after that, there will be a QA. and a uh, You can ask questions in the chat function. Uh, please do ask those questions because it's a very interesting presentation. And I will do my best to uh, put all the questions to Margaret so that she can answer them. Thank you for your attention. And uh, Margaret, I now give the floor uh, to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a very quick check if my presentation is in fact visible, because I don't seem to be able to see it on the screen. Yeah, your presentation is visible, Margaret, but it's it's with the uh, speaking notes. Okay. Uh, let me just see. And how about yes. now? Now it's fantastic. Okay. Good morning, Margaret, by the way. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much. Apologies for the slight technical glitch here. Uh, thank you for the nice, present nice introductions, and thank you, Martin, for introducing me to this webinar. It's really a privilege to be here, and uh, thank you to so many of you. I can see that there are quite a few of you attending who are uh, you know, taking a time out of what must be an incredibly busy schedule to listen to this webinar. I hope you will find it interesting. Uh, it is essentially to present my initial findings, a broad highlight from the study on the European implementation of the recommendations provisions that we have originally started in 2018 and in the current positions this is a follow-up about what the situation is how it may have changed and to provide some additional insight to it now in terms of the actual introductions uh, just to give a slight background to the study as i've already said and martin mentioned it as well i carried out similar study in 2018 and at that time, the data that was collected was benchmarked against the principle stated in the Commission recommendations 2014-478. And the main purpose of the study was really to find out if the member states' rules relating to place identifications, minus protections, and social responsibility measures have complied or have adopted the recommendations recommendations, suggestions, or whether this was not necessarily the case. But then also broadly speaking, the underlying aim of the original study and the report was to see if the recommendation, despite being non-mandatory and essentially advisory instrument at the EU level, would suffice to nudge member states into adopting rules that would be common across European jurisdictions. Now, the findings from the 2018 data collections exercise was that the recommendation has not essentially achieved a uniform set of rules. And the regulatory frameworks across different jurisdictions varied substantially. 
and it varied not at the high level. And I think this is important to stress out that when we look at the broad fundamental principles, they were almost the same across all member states. So it does give the appearance or the impressions of quite a lot of uniformity or even an element of harmonization. However, when looked at the specific details and the specific regulations within the most fundamental frameworks, the variations were almost infinite. And this is where the differences generally comes, not at the high level, but in the details itself. However, over the last three years, a lot of things happened. And within the gambling field, a lot of things happens generally. It tends to be an area that is quite rapidly moving in terms of changes to regulations or even legislations. Also, I'm sure nobody can quite forget that over the last full two years, we've been in the grip of a pandemic, which in our context is quite important because uh, the pandemic has emphasized and amplified concerns about mental health generally. And of course, in our purposes, uh, in terms of gambling disorders and gambling addictions, that is one aspect of mental health that came to the fore, especially as in various lockdowns, land-based establishments have closed. And there was a concern that far too many people may move to online gambling and may potentially develop gambling disorders as a result. The preliminary studies haven't quite showed that this is the case, uh, but it undisputably further amplified the need to look at consumer protections and ensure that it is as high as it can be for the purpose of gambling operators operating safely and responsibly and for the gamblers protections as well. So what is the purpose of the current phase of the study, which is from the 2021? This is essentially twofold. The first one is the same scope as it was in the original 2018. And as such, the reference points remains the EU Commission recommendation and it is appreciated, of course, that the recommendations by now can be considered quite old, has always been advisory, but it still remains the main instrument that addresses online gambling regulations across EU states at EU level. And because it is, it is still a valid benchmark and the current scope of the study also compares the state's implementations of the selected provisions of the recommendation itself. So the current data still focuses on the same areas as in 2018, meaning that we collected details of players' identifications and verifications requirements, methods and protections of minors, and of social responsibility measures. However, during this phase, we also collected some additional evidence, and this was to comp implement the previous data and to provide new insight, especially with regards to treatment support and enforcement principles. Now, it's also important to note that some of the questions and nuances have changed between 2018 and 2021. So direct comparisons only made when feasible and when the questions were essentially the same and new data is provided where the nuance has changed or new data has been collected. What also is interesting, that I hope you will find interesting, is that the data that we collected provided to me with the opportunity to create a list of national online portals of self-exclusion registers, which will be included in the report, and also a list of available helplines and problem gambling support websites, which hopefully will be applicable across all member states. So those are ones that will be included in the final report, and I'm not going to be discussing them here in details. In terms of the methodology, there is also slight change from 2018 to 2021, and this is that in 2018 we collected data from gambling providers, 
And the focus was mainly on gambling practices within the jurisdictions, whereas this time around we focused primarily on the legal and mandatory requirements as opposed to what the gambling operators may or may not do voluntarily. I have sent the uh, surveys and the questionnaires to all representatives of either regulatory bodies or the relevant department or ministry responsible for gambling regulations. And to date, I received 18 responses from regulators and ministers, hence the preliminary nature of the findings. Uh, we received additional further free responses from three different countries, from associations of lawyers or lawyers of, of the given jurisdictions. And there is only one country that I have to specifically mention, and this is France. And the reasons why I have to specifically mention them is because they formally declined to participate in the survey. And as such, the data for France has been collected from the industry member. The remaining responses, I hope they will come shortly and uh, hopefully they will be included in the final report. So uh, we by then hopefully not have many countries missing. Which brings me very neatly to the final point, and this is to say a massive thank you to all of you who have provided me with the responses. I'm sure the response came at the time when you were incredibly busy, we always are, and of course in the middle of the pandemic where lots of things were on everyone's mind. However, without your help, this project of course would not have been possible, and therefore it is really I'm really grateful that you took the opportunity to complete the questionnaires uh, in details and to send it to me at the relevant times. Also, thank you to the EGBA for providing the names of the relevant contact details and for supporting the collections of the data. So, coming to probably a more interesting part in terms of the key finding and the more specific findings. So, what are the key findings of the project? As I already briefly mentioned in 2018, Online gambling diverge materially between member states, but primarily in the details and not in the high level provisions. So the high level provisions being broadly comparable, but the granular discussions, this is where the variations came across quite strongly. Nevertheless, some commonalities were of course available and those common commonalities were identified to relating to the need as the need to open a gambling account before a player can engage in gambling. This is required in almost every jurisdiction, in every jurisdiction where uh, this matter is formally regulated, where there is an obligation to offer to players at least some or most of the social responsibility tools and the overall prohibitions of underage gambling. However, when it came to the matters as to how players are verified, whether temporary gambling accounts were permitted or not, duration of self-exclusions and the specific conditions attached to it, or even the existence of national self-exclusion registers, there was almost no uniformity at all. Coming to 2021, perhaps unsurprisingly, the situations in 2021 hasn't really changed dramatically and the variations between different states continue to exist. However, some amendments have been introduced in 10 states to either a whole of their provisions, Netherlands, for example, or to some of their provision. So, for example, as I've already mentioned, Netherlands lifted their online gambling ban, which means that now there is no single member states that actually prohibits online, online gambling as such. And other states, like for example Germany, also introduced the 2021 generic principles, which are somewhat different to what was previously the case. Now, what is important to note is that the changes that have taken place are multidirectional they're not all going in the one direction. So some of them have potentially can be argued to have made the regulations stricter. Some of them may be argued to have made the regulations more liberal, but some progress overall has been made. So to give a brief summary, since 2018, National Self-Exclusion Register has been set up in three more jurisdictions, which is great news. Six more states introduced mandatory no underage warning signs, which is equally great news. 
free no longer permits temporary accounts and free change minimum or maximum duration of self-exclusion schemes. Now, when we come to the more specific details, as you can anticipate, it is not possible for me to go into a great details during the durations of this webinar. So I'm going to focus on the main highlights to provide a broad summary. The details will, of course, be included in the final report that, as Martin already mentioned, will be ready not later than the end of November 2021. Now, in terms of the place identifications and verification requirements, this remains one of the most diverse area in the sense that there are many methods that can be used and are permitted within the different jurisdictions, and they are heavily dependent on what database and identification formats are used generally, and that it's irrespective of gambling. It's essentially about what databases exist and what other identification requirements are appropriate for the given state. Now, in terms of the place identification, there is one thing that also has to be noted, and this is that this is an area where, of course, gambling rules directly overlap with anti-money laundering legislation. And anti-money laundering legislations and the rules within different countries are not different so much, primarily because they are generally dictated at the EU level by the various uh, European level directives. And of course, online casinos are deemed to be designated entities for the purpose of anti-money laundering legislation. So they are under an obligation in the same way as financial institutions to ensure that the customers are verified that they are in fact who they claim to be. And because of the several anti-money laundering directives at the EU level, the situations across member states bear many similarities. So again, the variations don't come with the fundamental requirements to identify the customers. This exists in every state, either automatically upon opening of the gambling account or when the relevant threshold for the anti-money laundering legislations are reached. But they come from how the identification should take place and how it should be completed. Now, the Commission recommendation suggested that states should create a specially designated nationally standardized electronic databases for the purpose of verifying players, gamblers online. However, in 2018, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, only four states declared that such specifically designed database actually existed. So during the current phase, this part was approached slightly differently when we ask not whether it was specifically designed database for gambling purposes, but whether there is any database that has been designated as one that should be used for the purpose of verifications of online players. And this has created a significantly higher number of positive responses. And essentially, those are the countries which now declared the existence of a national electronic database. So there are 10 in total that has been specifically designated for the purpose of players' online verification. Now, the number of the countries with databases, electronic databases that can be used, goes even higher if we include other listed database that can be used for the purpose of electronic identity verifications and are in fact used by operators, even if they may not have necessarily been specified as the designated one. And this is important because just because a particular country has enlisted a specific electronic database, it doesn't mean it doesn't possess it. It simply means that it may not necessarily have been listed by the regulator. I either designated one or mentioned specifically as one that should be permitted. And this is because in most jurisdictions, almost all jurisdictions except Finland and Belgium, 
the actual choice of identity the def identity verification vests in the gambling operators and it is up to the gambling operators to make sure that they identify the customers properly rigorously and in line with the relevant regulations and if they wish to use the national electronic database or other commercial database or other permitted database then of course makes it potentially significantly easier but all other countries and all countries have also other methods that potentially are permitted and those methods include of course the manual verification by looking at the identity documents i highlighted one more which is the verification through financial system or secure digital signature because quite a few countries also have specifically declared that this is permitted but there are also countries where identity documents can be checked instead or in addition to the electronic verifications and in fact there are some countries where the identification process contains two stages the first stage is the electronic verifications and the second stage is the actual inspections of the identity documents and all those countries are of course listed in the actual report now when we look at the purposeability of the temporary gambling account the situation has slightly changed between the three years and thinking about it the existence of temporary accounts does remain controversial the reasons why it does remain controversial is because on one side you can argue that temporary accounts first of all should not be needed and they shouldn't be needed because at the moment in most states the verifications can in fact be instant because of the electronic verification methods secondly it can be argued that they undermine minors protections because they may permit a minor to play even if it is only for a short period of time or other social responsibility measures because again it may potentially permit someone to play who shouldn't be playing but on the other hand of course temporary accounts are important commercial tools and they have a very significant commercial value to prevent gambling operators from potentially losing customers who may not have the patience to wait for manual verifications if the electronic verifications fail and uh, also it ensures that the liberties of people to play without unnecessary delays and burdens are in fact respected but the recommendation itself suggested the existence of temporary account but not all countries agreed in 2018 and not all countries agree in 2021. now interestingly enough in 2018 the countries that are highlighted in the map permitted but that means that seven countries did not permit temporary account sweden at the time did not but already had amending legislations that now permits those accounts to take place the positions in 2021 however suggest a trend that it's contrary to the one that was envisaged by the recommendations because the countries that have permitted temporary accounts apologies the countries who haven't permitted temporary accounts continue not to permit them except sweden but we have also three other countries where the temporary accounts now are no longer permitted where previously they were either unregulated or not permitted and netherlands in their new regulatory frameworks also joined the list of countries that do not permit temporary accounts as opposed to the ones that do now in terms of the durations of temporary accounts in those countries where it is permitted at the moment the typical duration is 30 days one month except for germany which allocates a 72 hours period quite a few countries also have other financial limits and temporary limits temporary limits all the durations financial limits in terms of how much money can be deposited into the temporary accounts and no jurisdictions permits withdrawal of any winnings before verification is completed 
Interestingly, what happens to the funds in the temporary cans if verification is not successful? Most countries return to any deposit minus any potential winnings to the players. But in Romania, this is not taking place. And in fact, the funds accrue to the state budget. And in France, it can only happen if the player is in the end verified. And if it is not verified, if the player is not verified in a rather long duration, I think they have over six years in order to do so, then the money accrues to the state budget as well. But if the player is verified, they can reclaim it back. Moving on to the protections of minors in gambling advertising, we only this time around re-examined the requirements as to whether the no underage gambling sign should be included in the gambling advertising. And this is because it was presumed that uh, the overall prohibitions on underage gambling would not have changed. The generic age of who is permitted to gamble and who is not wouldn't necessarily change either. But the positions with regards to the sign itself was quite varied at the time. So in 2018, we had 12 states. Uh, well, we had UK, but now UK is excluded from the study. But we had 12 states that included mandatorily this site in commercial gambling advertising. Others may have done it so voluntarily, but not necessarily prescribed by law. And this has now increased to 17 states. Again, technically 18, but as the UK left the EU, then uh, it's back to 17. Now, in Italy, gambling continues to be prohibited, and in Bulgaria and Latvia, the gambling advertising is severely restricted, so those signs are not necessarily needed, and therefore, it kind of shows a really positive trend in this respect with regards to minus protections. This is particularly important because recent studies do indicate that across Europe, the online gambling by minors may potentially be increasing. So the jurisdictions have to continue to engage in strategies to prevent underage from having the opportunities to gamble either on, uh, online or otherwise. But educational campaigns and all specific signs and concerted effort like that always help. Now, in terms of safer gambling principles and uh, special social responsibility tools, this is where the biggest variations continue to exist. And even though the starting positions in all jurisdictions is that operators or nationally have to offer social, several social responsibility tools, the principles vary quite enormously and continue to vary. Now, in terms of safer gambling principles, typically we can put them into three different categories. The first one is when we control the gambling environment. The second one is when we control the inherent characteristics of the gambling product. And the third one is when we give the players appropriate tools to help them or enable them to control their own gambling behaviors. The recommendation itself focuses on the first and third category, and most European jurisdictions at the moment do the same. So in terms of the principles, the most obvious one and the most relevant one in this context is the self-exclusion and time and deposit limits. So self-exclusion schemes is offered either by operators and or nationally in all jurisdictions. Only in free states, this is not prescribed by law, but it's still offered voluntarily by gambling operators who generally do it and go above what it's essentially expected of them by the legal requirements within the jurisdiction. However, the duration vary, and that has varied in 2018 from seven days, that now has decreased, and it's varied from 24 hours to 12 months as a minimum period, and from three years to permanent lifetime as a maximum. So some states permit a permanent self-exclusion, some states don't. Some states, Latvia, for example, has only one period of self-exclusion, which is 12 months. Others, like Spain, 
operates on the basis of generally permanent self-exclusions. Now, in terms of third parties, as to who can self-exclude a particular customers, this is always an interesting question because if we look at the title self-exclusions, by definition, self-exclusions should be initiated by the player. And there is some merit in asking the players to take this positive step to self-exclude themselves because it gives a clear indication that they themselves recognize that they have a problem potentially or they do not wish to gamble, which often is a very important part in the treatment. However, in some countries, in 10 states specifically, it is possible to self-exclude customers by somebody else. So interested parties, a family members, an operator, or any other party may apply to include an individual on a self-exclusion register. Now, in seven countries, a court order is not required in order to do so, but of course, in each stance, the standard automatic right to appeal against self-exclusions exists. Once on the self-exclusion registers, normally the expectation is that people will remain for the duration specified. And as in most countries, uh, the durations can be set by the players themselves, except where the country set the minimum or maximum period of time, which supersede any other choices, then the expectation is that the players will stay there for the duration of the self-exclusion. However, permanent self-exclusions can be terminated in all countries, but this is typically subject to the minimum period that must elapse before a customer can remove themselves from self-exclusion register. And some countries have additional requirements of cooling off periods or a written applications to the relevant body or a proof that they no longer suffer from a problem gambling. In the context of temporary self-exclusions, temporary self-exclusions can not be revoked in free states and others also have a significant minimum periods that must elapse. In terms of deposit and time limits, they are in existence in all jurisdictions and the durations and the actual time limits or whether it is set up by the operators or it is set up by the players also vary. Only one state did not formally prescribe that operators must offer deposit or time limits to the customers. And 16 EU member states now have a national self-exclusion register, which is an increase from the previous situations and shows a positive trend in this regard. So in terms of the existence of national self-exclusion registers in 2018, those were the countries that had them. And then in 2021, we have three more countries that uh, either already set up or are almost setting up the national self-exclusion register as well. Now, with regards to Finland, Finland doesn't technically have a self-exclusion register, but as they are a monopoly provider and a monopoly must keep their own self-exclusion register itself, it formally satisfies the requirements as well. During the current phase of the study, we also collected the data of whether the customers can self-exclude themselves via an online portal. And this online portal would exclude the customers from all the available gambling providers a block, essentially a block exclusion. And almost all countries but free with the national self-exclusion registers allow the customers to exclude themselves via the online portal as well. And the list of this online portals and the website addresses will be included in the report as well. Finally, an additional questions were asked, which were not asked previously, and this is with regards to a treatment support. In 2018, the only questions that was asked with regards to treatment support was that whether gambling providers must automatically refer self-excluded customers to problem support helplines or other treatment centers. 
And perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer in all jurisdictions for those at the time was no. And in fact, the recommendation doesn't uh, recommend such an uh, intrusive measure per se. So what we did this time around, we ask whether states require gambling operators to display the links of the treatment support centers and problem gambling helplines on their website, whether self-exclusion triggers any specific registration, any specific interactions between the operators and the customers, and whether direct advertising is prohibited to the self-excluded customers. Now, with regards to the first questions, only one state declared that there is no legal requirement to display information with contact details. All of the others specified it must be done. In the Netherlands, it's even stricter as the operators must have a specific contract with a mental health provider to whom they may refer their customers. And nine states also declared that self-exclusion triggers specific interventions. With regards to prohibitions of direct advertising to self-excluded customers, that perhaps surprisingly was only declared as mandatory prohibited in 10 jurisdictions, and in others, this requirement tends to be subsumed within overall prohibitions of advertising to vulnerable individuals, except for the countries, of course, where advertising is generally heavily restricted. Now, a new set of questions was also asked about enforcement and broad enforcement principles in the sense that um, we try to identify not how states uh, prevent unlawful gambling and how to channel the customers to the lawful providers, as this has been comprehensively evaluated in a specific report for the EU, but more about the granular details of how, who is the responsible body within the given state, how they ensure that the licensed providers comply with the specific rules that apply within the jurisdictions, and also to ascertain uh, a level of enforcement and regulatory controls. This is something that will be included in the report, and as we are now running out of time, I don't have time to discuss it in details, but the details with all the tables will be uh, published together with the report as well on the enforcement principle as well. So, just briefly to conclude, as we can see, there has been some significant changes between 2018 and 2021 that was certainly beneficial to add the additional insight as to the position currently. Many of the high-level provisions are very similar across the jurisdictions, and the fundamental principles are met in all states. They do have regulatory frameworks for online gambling. So in many ways, uh, the recommendations may not have necessarily influenced or impacted as much as it was intended, but it has made uh, contributions in ensuring that the fundamental principles are complied everywhere. However, the nuances and specific details continue to vary enormously. And it does kind of raise the questions to um, people like me and other researchers as to the reasons behind it. And that's because many of the uh, many of the provisions, for example, of identity verifications are in fact unique to the countries and how individual people are registered and verified for other purposes. So this isn't an area where harmonizations would possibly be possible. But many others are quite superficial. And for example, there doesn't seem to be any specific rationale as to the different duration of self-exclusion and why each country has got their own minimum and maximum durations and why those areas cannot be relatively common. So the question remains as to the extent to which the differences are true, real differences that may not necessarily be overcome by the relevant political people who decide these matters, or whether they actually could be worked together in order to bring more uniformity across. There seems to be a more, more overall convergence in any case, um, so in many ways it does show a positive trend. I appreciate it was a rather quick run through the details without um, going into the list as to which states provide what. I hope the maps were reasonably clear. 
And uh, the final report is the one where all the relevant details will be clearly uh, shown in the tables for easy comparisons. For now, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to try to answer if there are any specific questions, and I hope you find it somewhat insightful. Thank you very much, um, Margaret. Thank you very much for this extremely useful presentation, also very uh, professional. I'm very impressed. Uh, it's, it's something different to hear a professional uh, do a presentation. It's almost like a time warp back to university, to be perfectly honest, but I, I really appreciate it. It was a very good presentation. Um, I think much. just also for logistical purposes, this uh, has been recorded uh, and it will be shared with the uh, attendees tomorrow. The slides we will not share, uh, but obviously the study will be available um, in uh, hopefully a month's time, within a month's time. Uh, we have a few a few uh, questions already, uh, so I, I, I'll start with the first one. I think especially one, for instance, on the verifications. So these are quite different between the member states. Um, and some are more, let's say, digital than others, which are, are, are still kind of old fashioned. Uh, and there's also questions about efficiency, I guess, by using um, still paper documentations. And can you say a bit more about effectiveness uh, and how that uh, affects KYC? And also, there is a proposal from the European Commission for a European uh, EID, uh, which would be then be uh, usable across all the member states. And would something like that help in KYC? And obviously, KYC, as you said yourself, is very important for consumer protection, AML, and other purposes. So that's the, the first question. Thank you, Martin, and it's an excellent question. Um, the e European EID would certainly help for efficiencies, uh, but only if it was commonly applied and accepted across all jurisdictions, and also the element whether the individual's customers would be happy with that. Um, coming from an English perspective, which of course it's uh, not perhaps so much relevant at the moment uh, for the purpose of European Union, um, but for example, English people, we don't tend to have IDs, specific IDs, we have passports and driving licenses and lots of other IDs, but not a specific ID for the purpose of identifications. And there are electronic ID verifications offered by commercial providers uh, who I used, but they're not as popular as they probably need to be in order to make it successful. European member states tend to be less resistant to ID documents generally, which is probably why uh, if there is an electronic ID that is common to all jurisdictions and one that is happily used, but the at least majority of the consumers, that would certainly help and if there was the possibility of verifying the customers, which it would be because it already permitted now for all the commercial EIDs in these countries that offer it, then it would help the gambling operators and the um, consumers to be verified almost instantly, which would have lots of positive effects as far as I'm concerned. One of it is that temporary cans would genuinely disappear because there would be no need for them because verifications would be instant. And those who may not like an EID perhaps would have to uh, accept that there may be some delay between their verifications. Uh, but again, ID and principles, I absolutely agree. It's great, but it really would be subject to implementations. Will it be implemented across all member states? Will it be accepted by all consumers? And will it be accepted by the people to make it feasible? In terms of the manual verifications, manual verification is the most kind of burdensome and inefficient. It's certainly much quicker now because we have the scanning mechanisms, we have video conferences. So things are actually getting significantly easier than it may have been the situation in 20 years ago or something like that. Um, but I would never want to remove a manual verifications and the possibility of it. Primarily because uh, electronic database and any other database, they take time to update and the updates are not necessarily daily. Some countries may have daily updates, some may have annual updates. So if we remove the possibility of a manual 
verifications, then people who, for example, moved countries or recently relocated would um, face additional burdens unnecessarily. And even though it may be a small number of people who would be subjected to it, there is no need to remove them altogether and they should still have the possibility to be verified if they want to. I'm not sure whether this answered the questions, but I hope it does. No, no, absolutely. Thank you very much. We also have a few questions about, I just quickly move on there, Margaret. Uh, so thank you for the answer. We have a few questions about self-exclusion, which is something that I noted as well. Uh, huge disparate differences between um, what is availability, but also about whether you can undo it or not, the periods and what have you. And so the, my question is, uh, are you aware on what basis um countries actually set the parameters for the self-exclusion um and, and and a question from the audience was also what would need to be done to create some sort of a common standard for self-exclusion so same topic two slightly different questions yeah it's very interesting questions because to answer your questions unfortunately the answer is no i don't know why there are the differences and on what basis uh, different states uh, decide what is the minimum and maximum self-exclusions. Um, in terms of the uh, common standards, the recommendation is, is the recommendation doesn't provide many many definitions, but there is one definition of cooldown of the uh, timeout and of self-exclusion. And as far as the recommendation is concerned, self-exclusions should be for a minimum duration of six months, whereas a timeout should be for a minimum duration of 24 hours. I guess the usage of the different words timeout and self-exclusion uh, may be confusing because at the end of the day, what's the difference between the timeout and self-exclusions except the duration itself? So the common standard kind of, at least with regards to the minimum duration is already there. That should be six months, which is not applicable in many jurisdictions. Um, in terms of what needs to be done, um, to some extent, um, there is the tensions between allowing the players to decide how long a break they need and uh, allowing them to set up the periods of the self-exclusions and also the responsibility of the gambling operators. One of the reasons why some countries do not permit a permanent exclusion is because it does impose quite a significant burden of the gambling operators to ensure that potentially forever, they may check, they, may, they must check if the customer is included on the register or not. And uh, that perhaps is quite a significant burden that some countries are not happy with, while others say that this should be relatively straightforward for gambling operators to do so. So I don't know the, the exact rationale is behind it, but this really is about the tensions between, between ensuring that players have a sufficient break from gambling and are protected because it's not enough to simply close the account because uh, that's, of course, when you self-exclude, the obligation is on the gambling operators is to close the account. But that's per se is not enough because what stops the customers if they have a particularly difficult day or particularly difficult moment in the recovery to open another account with another provider or with the same provider even if the main obligation is just to close the account. The obligations for the operators to ensure that they monitor who are excluded and prevent reopening of this account and prevent using within the period of time is quite significant, which is why the durations may differ because each country may think that different durations are feasible or reasonable as to what can or should be expected from the operators. Thank you, Margaret. I think we have time for one more question with your with your um, permission. There's one question about advertising and affiliate regulation differences in Europe, but I think that's beyond the scope of this study. Uh, yeah, we had one more question then about self-exclusion. I think you, you mentioned somewhere that nine uh, member states require an intervention after self-exclusion. Um, is that, um, the question is, do you have more information about that? And is that something that uh, you can elaborate on? 
Uh, only slightly, because um, in terms of the self-exclusion principles, it has to be understood in the context of the overall intervention and responsibility measures. And uh, in almost all countries, the gambling operators will be required to have specific interventions if they identify that customers, for example, are at risk of developing gambling problems, if the patterns or behavior of the gambling of individuals uh, indicate difficulties. Um, so there are quite a few layers of uh, interventions that are imposed in various states way before the self-exclusions actually takes place. And in some, the specific interventions may be included as part of those other layers, whereas in the report, in the current data collection exercise, we focus specifically whether self-exclusion triggers specific intervention. So that is being reported as only being the case in nine states, where if a customer self-excludes, the gambling operators is required to inform this customer of the specific problem gambling helpline and their contact details. Uh, but that doesn't mean that in other countries there is no interventions at all. It simply means that it may be subsumed with the overall provision. So that is really about the specific intervention principles. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Margaret, for answering uh, all those questions and for your presentation. Uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Thank you also to the participants for uh, signing in and, and listening to the webinar, looking at the webinar as well. Um, we will uh, share, as I said, the uh, recording of this with you uh, tomorrow. And we will also make um, available, obviously, once the study has been published by Margaret via a link, or maybe via the same email, uh, a link to the study so that the attendees can uh, can can um, look at the study as well once you've published it, Margaret. Um, so thank you again. Thank you very much, and I uh, hope to see you soon again. Thank you all. Thank you very much from me as well. It's a privilege to be here.